This is Abnormal Entertainment. Two, three, four. Walk into the tunnel just to find the light. Hunted for all demons, looking for a fight. Looked up at the stars, seemed to go forever. There must be a way it all fits together. Fell into the quicksand, held on to the vines. Never could quite color, stay within the lines. Feels like I have wings, I can fly wherever. This is just a way it all fits together. Finally saw the world through rose-colored glasses. Gonna share my journey to small and large masses. Give up on my life, no sir, me never. This is how I put it together. This is how I put it together. This is how I put it together. Hey everybody, this is Daniel Garza and welcome to another episode of Put It Together. I'd like to start as usual, thanking my producer, Mr. Kevin Moyers, for all his celebrated support. Thank you, sir. Inviting everybody to check us out at abnormalentertainment.com. We can find all the shows on the record, check it out, and see if there's something there for you. Uh, this week, I am excited to have, uh, now have him on my podcast, <laughs> uh, Vince Wells. How you doing, sir? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I was, we were talking in the pre-interview that I was having a crummy day and I almost bailed on this without even remembering that I had it, uh, but I'm glad you did, so thank you. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of uh, speaking of podcasts, you know, I spent the last couple of days uh, working on getting the remainder of that show. You know, the first episode, first half of the show that we recorded at Healthy Voices went live this morning. Yes. And so next Thursday will be the second half of that. So I think it, I think it turned out pretty well. I was actually, I thought, well, while I'm, while I'm walking, I'll listen to it. But I, I'm still after this going to go walk and. Uh, have some coffee and listen to this. See what I said. Don't you find it always <laughs> like you got you have to go back and wonder what did I say on these things? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, for those of you listening, I met Vince for the first time. It's been three weeks now. Two weeks now. Three weeks, I think. Three weeks. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure you guys have heard me talk about Healthy Voices Conference. I went on and on about it last year. Uh, I haven't had a chance this year, but uh, Vince. And um, Gabe Howard co-host a podcast. You want to tell us a little bit about that before we sure. start? Sure. Uh, our show is called The Psych Central Show, um, which is, of course, as the name implies, hosted on psychcentral.com. <laughs> and it's a, it's a weekly show, roughly half an hour in length. And we have uh, – Primarily, we do guest shows, although occasionally you'll find uh, just me and him chittering about something in the news or what have you. But uh, the show that we did at Healthy Voices, the live broadcast, the live recording, I should say, was was really interesting. Having you and three other advocates on stage there with us and everything went, it, it really could not have gone better. We Good. are so happy with how it turned out. Can you tell us a little bit about the the topic or the subjects that you bring up on your podcast? Wow. Um, they are pretty varied, honestly. We talk about um, a lot of different mental health conditions. We have featured a few different guests with, for example, schizophrenia. Um, Gabe, of course, has bipolar disorder. Uh, and I've, I've spoken about persistent depressive disorder. Sorry, hold on just a second. Yep. Going. Sorry about that, guys. Um, so that was my uh, cleaning lady. She uh, she came in this morning and knew that I wasn't feeling well. And when I was going through cancer, one of the few things that I was able to eat were these soup bowls that she would make. They would sell at the restaurant. They would prep them 
up them up a little bit. But those were one of the few things that I could eat when I was sick. And she knew I wasn't feeling well, so she stopped by to bring me a couple of bowls so that well, I could have them for dinner. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah, so uh, Patty Hernandez, my, my cleaning lady, she's been my cleaning lady now for like, almost two years. She's wow. awesome. She's awesome. <laughs> um, anyway, we were talking about the uh, the show, and we are talking about you. Yeah, we are talking about the show a little bit. Um, you had asked about the different topics that we cover. I mentioned the different uh, mental health conditions we do, and as I said, a lot of guests. Uh, we've talked about things like retail therapy, um, what it's really like being in a psych hospital, why people believe in conspiracy theories. I mean, it's kind of all over the board. It's it's a lot of fun. So um, you mentioned that Gabe mm -hmm. is bipolar, and right. What what's your side? Of Mine it? is persistent depressive disorder. Okay, got it. Um, well, let's get started with, with talking about you. So, Vince Wells, tell us how you put it together. How I put it together. Um, you know, the funny thing is that I never really considered myself much of a mental health advocate. I mean, I've never shied away from talking about it or anything like that. I've always been open and out about it. But a little over a year and a half ago, Gabe says to me, hey, um, I want to do a podcast. I'm like, hey, have fun. <laughs> he said, no, no, I, I want you to be my co-host on the show. And one thing led to another, and so here I am doing that and being on your show and going to Healthy Voices, and, you know, it's just all kind of snowballed from yeah. there. I think I've, we don't go into advocacy. Advocacy pulls us in somehow. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Um, so this year was your first year at the Healthy Voices. Yes, it was. Yeah, uh, it was a good time. I guess a good place to start talking about advocacy is is there. Mm -hmm. uh, for the people listening, um, Healthy Voices is a yearly conference. This was their fourth year that is put on by Jensen Pharmaceuticals. That is a sub of uh, Johnson & Johnson. So they take care of us for three or four days, depending on the group that you're with. I was there representing HIV, AIDS, and Vince, you were with the mental health groups, correct? Right. And this year, there's 122 advocates from around the world uh, coming together in their individual groups, but we also come together from different groups to see how we can help each other. Uh, there's a lot of uh, cross uh, illnesses or cross yeah. issues. Yeah. Uh, so I guess let's start there. Since you're kind of new to the advocacy world, how did it feel to find people with so many similarities to you? Um, it didn't surprise me, truthfully. I mean, I, I know how widespread depression is uh, in our country, and I, 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 did a, uh, I, I did a stint as a suicide prevention crisis counselor a little while there so you know i do i did have I, I don't call that advocacy but it was just you know part of what i did and it didn't surprise me as i said to to find all these people and as you recall the the thrust of the whole conference was what we all have in common despite having very different diseases and conditions we're all kind of in this together and 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 that of course also was the thrust of our of the show that we recorded there with you. All right. Um, may I may I get into the depression part? And yeah, sure. Um, how old were you when you were first diagnosed or first? I was I was diagnosed when I was in college, and I would guesstimate that I was probably oh twenty twenty one somewhere in. I, I honestly don't remember what specific right. year it was, but it was around that age. Um, but at the time, the, uh, the psychologist who handed down this diagnosis told me that I'd probably had it since I was a child. And looking back now with all of the education I have and everything about it, it's pretty obvious that, that I did have it when I was quite young. For the folks that are listening, what were some of those obvious things that you look at now? Well, as most everybody knows, that depression symptoms – are things like feeling run down a lot, lacking the ability to be really excited about doing anything. You lose interest in things that you 
previously enjoyed. Uh, you tend to want to just be a recluse all the time. And when I was very young, you know, I was, I was a typical kid. I was outgoing and everything that a kid's supposed to be. But then by the time I got into, say, junior high, that started to change and I became more and more reclusive and I didn't, I wasn't outgoing any longer. And so, you know, I look at all that and think, well, yep, that, that parses. Now for a lot of us, cause you see you were in like in your early twenties for a lot of us going through the teenage years, a lot of us go through that. You're just disconnected. You just don't want to be part of You're You're the oddball at school, you know, whatever. Um, was it was it difficult or was it easier once you got to your 20s to go, okay, it's not a teenager thing? Um, Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I get what you're saying. Was it easier? Well, it helped to have a name for it because, you know, this was back in the 80s and depression was not as well known in the general population. Certainly wasn't talked about like it is today. So when he said chronic depression, I was like, oh, is that what this is? Okay. okay, how do we get rid of it? And, you know, today I laugh at that, but, you know, at the time I was quite serious. I thought, okay, well, good. It's it's a condition I can get rid of. What do I do? Right. And that was when he said, well, you've you've probably had this most of your life, and you will probably have it for the rest of your life. At which point I just kind of stared at him like, what? <laughs> but he said, but we can make it better. And so, of course, that began my, my first round of counseling right then and there. So it was, um, I wouldn't say it was easier, but it was, it was good to have a better understanding of it anyway. And, and also part of the question was, was it easier to diagnose in your 20s than it would have been in your teen years? Oh, probably. Probably. Because as you just pointed out, you know, when you're a teenager, your, your life's messed up anyway. <laughs> so, you know, it's, uh, and and this is, in fact, you're I'm glad you brought that up because this is a show that we are going to be doing on our podcast, which is specifically to talk about depression in younger people because the way that it manifests, the way that it, it expresses itself in children, for example, is very different from how it expresses itself in an adult. And this is something not a lot of people know. So that's something we're going to be uh, educating. Oh, cool. So we'll yeah, yeah. Make sure to send that show over to us when you do. Of course. of course. Um, how does depression work like in your twenties? Like for instance, we're in our early twenties. We want to go out. We want to drink. We want to be at the party with our friends. Uh, there's, <laughs> well, there's alcohol, there's drugs, there's extras. There's well, drugs. there, there wasn't for me. Oh, uh, okay. I like most Teenagers, I, I did my little share of underage drinking. Shh, don't tell anybody. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. But I quit when I was 18. Oh. And then I never touched another drop of alcohol for 20 years. Wow. So all through college, when all my friends were going out and getting wasted, I was, you know, sitting at home with a book and a Dr. Pepper. You know, that was, that was my life. I didn't, I didn't go out really. Um, I didn't, um, I didn't want to be in the parties. Now I'm, I'm an introvert too. So even, even without the depression, large gatherings and, and loud, obnoxious parties are not my thing. I, I just don't, I'm not drawn to them at all. Okay. So throughout the episode, I'll play devil's advocate a little bit because I think sure. this conversation lends itself to educate people. Um, then what I would say, well, then you're not depressed. You're just an introvert. You're not, you're just antisocial. You're not depressed. Well, <laughs> if that were the limit to it, yeah. But of course, there are all the other symptoms. There are the, the suicidal ideations, you know, um, the binge eating that I would do to make myself feel better. Uh, you know, just stuff like that. Yeah. Cause, um, People on my show, we've talked about this other times. Um, uh, I've been diagnosed with depression and anxiety and health-related PTSD, and, which I didn't know was a thing until after my cancer diagnosis. Uh, but I didn't know 
I didn't understand why some days all I wanted to do was sit through a can of Pringles. <laughs> and J- Just one? Well, if, <laughs> if, unless I went to the dollar store <laughs> and stocked up. Uh, and that was my th- – that's my thing. Like I, Because I, we're talking about eating – my thing is go to the dollar store because it's cheaper, and for twenty bucks I can get a ton. Yes, you can. Of goodies, and and then I don't feel so guilty eating them all in one evening because it only really cost you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but I didn't realize that that was part of my depression to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, now, in the suicide part, I've always pondered what it would look like. But I've never really gone. I'm, I'm, when I was drinking and drugging, yes, I, I, but I didn't know how much it added to the depression. Right. When I, when I was using. Right. Um, the, and I'll just put it out. The only thing I, I I ever really did was I used to have this little uh, Geo Metro kind of car, and I I lived in South Texas, and I would go on the freeway at like a hundred and ten miles, and then just just hit the brakes. And near a bridge and hope that it would tumble over. Huh. Uh, it never did. And obviously right. it never did. Um, right. Right. But does, the, does any of that resonate? Oh yeah. Um, for me, it was, um, um, during these, again, back in college, I, I walked to, to campus from my off campus apartment and had to go past this very major intersection in town. And, Public transportation buses would just whiz through there at very high rates of speed. And I, I frequently would be standing there thinking, boy, I could just step off the curb here and that would be all she wrote. You know, it would be a very, very quick thing. But I never did, obviously. Right. Otherwise, we'd be two ghosts doing a podcast. Yeah, that would be kind of cool. That would be a, a two, two, <laughs> ghosts, two ghosts in a podcast. Because um, I, I, I'm starting to figure out that there is a slight difference between depressive and suicidal true yeah. right can, yeah. can you do you have any in, insight on yeah that? well i can say that i haven't really had any suicidal ideations since college but the depression itself is has always been present um my as i said persistent depressive disorder is is the type that i have and that is not one that most people are familiar with. Everybody's familiar with major depression, right. where you get so, so depressed that, you know, you can't get out of bed and, and all this and all that. Now, that kind of thing is, it goes in cycles. You know, you'll right. be miserable for a little while, and then things will be better, and you get to be normal again for a while. And then, of course, you know. But for me, my normal is depressed. Okay. You know, I, 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 one of the things that my, uh, my friends will often ask me about said, Hey, you're going on vacation next week. Or are you excited? And my response to me, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Cause I don't, I don't get excited. It's not a feeling that I'm terribly familiar with anymore. I mean, I remember of course, being a kid, being excited for Christmas and all of that, but yeah, that's, that's ancient history now. So my normal is what most people would consider really freaking subdued, you know? And of course I do have periods of, of much worse depression as well, but fortunately the, the suicidal ideations are, are pretty much a thing of the past. Now th- that sounds similar to like, I, I live with pain. Chronic pain. Yeah. It's yes. Better. They are very similar. So okay. I've learned that, I tell people I'm normally at a 10% pain level. That's normal. But I've learned to live with it. So anything below a 10 is good. Yeah, yeah. And and we, you and I have that in common too. I, I had a, a nasty bicycle accident when I was about 14 and my spine got all screwed up. And I've, I've lived with chronic pain since then too. And th- it is, it's very similar to dysthymia, persistent depressive disorder, because sometimes, you know, my normal okay days, yes, I'm aware that I'm in pain, but it's a lot less than I was, you know, a week ago, Right. but it's probably going to be bad tomorrow. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's the same, it's a, yeah, same thing. Have you, or do you live in the, let's enjoy today as today? Let's. 
I, I think I've always been like that. I've, I've never been really good at planning for the future. And when I was younger, um, I was accused a lot of living in the past. And I did. I, I dwelled a lot on, on my past. Uh, unfortunately, I never dwelled on the parts of the past that I should have because, see, I didn't know why I was depressed. I, I really didn't. And, of course, we didn't explore that particularly in my, my first round of counseling. But in, in later years, much later, in fact, I did finally get to the root of where everything started. And it was kind of an eye-opening sort of thing. And, and I saw how this, this one event, when I was like five years old, had really shaped so, so much of my future life. And, uh, yeah, had I, had I spent time dwelling on that when I was in college, I might be in a better place right now. Hmm. Well, let's, let's explore a little bit about uh, talking about today. Let's explore where life is like today. Sure. Because I, I, I'll admit that when we sat down at, for the podcast at the conference, I wasn't, I didn't, wasn't, I, this was not knowledge to me. I didn't sure. know. Your, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have thought it. Not that you were overly excited or anything, but I have a, when I'm alone and I'm not feeling well, my mood is low. So when somebody else is at that level with me, I'm like, oh, good. There's somebody, <laughs> there's somebody else in here. Cause, uh, I love Anne Marie, but Anne Marie was sitting next to me and she is a ball of energy. Oh, she is. Yeah. So it was nice to have somebody else at the, at the panel that was like, okay, we, I can, I can talk to this guy. Yeah. Um, yeah. are you, and I'm going to use the word happy. Are you okay with where you are now? Have you made peace with it? Um, wow. Interesting question. I, I understand better about why I am how I am. That doesn't really do anything to, to fix it. In a lot of ways, I am content with where I am in life. In other ways, not, you know, um, I don't know what else to say about that. It's it's kind of kind of yes and no. I mean, the whole this new part of my life with the podcast and the advocacy and stuff. It's that's going quite well. It's 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 neat. It's interesting. It's it's new. So that's kind of nifty. But um, other parts of my life, you know, I'm I'm not I'm not in a relationship right now. I'd like to be. That's that's just not happening at this moment. Um, I'm I'm a writer. Uh, I have I have a few books published. And I'm working on another one right now that I've been really struggling with, which is a new experience for me because in the past my books have always come pretty easily, but this one is I, I'm I'm not having fun <laughs> with this one. But uh, so and you know and of course that part of my my life that uh, that career goal of being nothing but an author and not having to work a day job. That hasn't materialized yet. So, so yeah, not real, not real content with that yet either. Because I've had other guests who have, who had suffered from something for a long time without a name for it. And then when the name finally came up or the, or, oh, this is what you've had all this time. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, okay, I know that I'm still in that cycle or in that, I don't, I'm not going to say a box. I'm, I'm in that ball because I feel like a ball, you, you're just going around and around and around. Um, but at least I have a name for it now. Right. So I can feel, I, I don't feel like I'm completely nuts. Like there's a, there's a name for what's going on in my body and I can understand it better. Right. Because when you don't know, that just makes it worse. Because yeah. you can also, you know, in, in situations like that, you can uh, imagine much worse than it really is for one thing. But even when even when your diagnosis is a bad one, you're right. You at least have that feeling of like, oh, okay, now it has a label. Now I understand it. Now now I'm I'm ready to move forward. Whereas yeah. before, you're just as you said, kind of spinning your wheels. 
Yeah, because I remember, because it hasn't been that long ago, in, in 2014 when I was getting very, very bloated and I didn't understand what was going on because I was, I'm not a huge eater. Um, I used to be, but, and I would, I would get bloated and I was eating less and I was still bloated. I'm like, what's going on? And then we finally realized that it was anal cancer and that's what was keeping me bloated. I was like, Oh, good. Like, at least I know what's going on. Cause I was like, I'm doing everything to lose weight and it's not working. And, and I finally had, of course, the outcome was a pain in the ass, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> perhaps, thank you, Father. Thank you. That's my ever going, uh, that's, that's my go-to butt joke. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at least I knew what was going on and now we could take care of it. Um, so that's why I asked, like, if, if, once you know, once you know where your level is, yeah, it, in my case, though, it was kind of messed up because, well, like for you, it's like, oh, anal cancer. Doctor, what do I do about that? And the doctor tells you and you say, okay, let's have at it. For me, <laughs> I was diagnosed by a psychologist, right? So he couldn't prescribe meds even if he would wanted to, right? Uh. But the irony is that I wouldn't have taken them anyway. Because I was under the impression that I, and this is, this is embarrassing for me to admit, I was one of those schmucks who thought that I could just tough it out. I could triumph over, over depression without any, any help from, you know, a talk therapist or, or, or a bottle. I, I didn't need those things. Well, of course I did. You know, I was an idiot. And in fact, I didn't start taking antidepressants until I was in my forties. So what? all of those, it was like two decades there of time when I should have been on meds, but I wasn't. And I can't even imagine how much different my life would have been if I had been. Well, let's, can you tell us about that? How was life when you were toughing it out? Well, let's put it this way. Um, <laughs> I was married twice and divorced twice. Okay. And I am absolutely certain that, especially in my first marriage, the, the depression was a major factor in why things ended. So there's that. (laughs) Um, I I laugh at it because it's not funny, but because I have to, you know, I I get that. Yeah. How, How, from your perspective, how did the trickle effect work with, with your spouses or your family, your friends? Well, you know, um, I, Never really talked about it much with my family. Um, and that may be just a family thing because my family is one of those that doesn't really discuss the negative things. We just kind of keep them at arm's length and pretend they don't exist. Yep. Um, so, no, I never really talked much about my depression with my family because I, I didn't think they would understand it. Hell, I didn't understand it for that matter. So my friends, um, most of them just, they, they, they didn't know what to do, of course, because they didn't know, know anything about depression either. So it was difficult to talk with them. So I pretty much just kept it to myself and allowed it to, you know, do its damage. What was the damage? <laughs> well, the damage was not... Uh, not being where I wanted to be because the depression would prevent me from, from trying things, right. From taking chances. Um, the, the low self-esteem part of depression, of course, has always been big for me. Um, I have very few things that I'm really proud of, you know, that I am confident about myself one of them is, um, one of them is my, is my, my writing. I, I'm very proud of my works and, and I do have a lot of confidence in that regard. But most everything else, I just forget it. I'm just kind of a mess. Yeah. Um, how, cause you, I mean, I was, you're a writer, but how does it affect your, Besides the obvious social skills, uh, other than, than withdrawing and, and, and being a loner, per se, um, 
when you are faced with a moment where you have to be in a crowd, right? Where, where you have to, like, for instance, at the conference with so many mm-hmm. people, how, what do you tell yourself or how do you walk yourself through that? Well, here's the funny thing is I am an introvert, but I've always wanted to be an extrovert. You know, I, I love people. I really do. It's just that I prefer to take them in small doses, you know, <laughs> tiny little groups. I would much rather have one or two close friends come over and hang out at my apartment than I would to go out with a group of eight or 10 friends. I just, it, to me, it's, you know, more, more, uh, more my thing. The conference, um, I have a lot of experience with other conferences, so I'm, I'm pretty much okay with them because if I need to take a break, I can take a break. I can just walk away. And at the Healthy Voices Conference, they, they regularly said that. Right. If you need to recharge, don't feel obliged to stick around, go to your room, chill out for a couple hours, then come back. And, and that's what I would have to do. And I, and I do that in other social situations as well. I need to recharge by being alone. Yeah. And I get, I get that. Yeah. Especially when I'm, I love speaking in front of people and I think I'm good at it. But when, when I'm done, I need to yep. I run. Yep. I'm done. <laughs> Take a bow. There's no, there's no encore. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, how, has the process of being on a podcast, sharing your thoughts, uh, because you do have to share your opinion sometimes too, or or put in a little bit of your own story into it. Uh, how has that been for you? It's been fine. Uh, as I said earlier, I, I've never shied away from talking about my life, my experiences, my depression. So I'm okay with doing that. And I'm, opinionated so i'm fine with sharing my opinion on things too so uh yeah so yeah i mean it's the podcast has really been a, a good experience yes um uh, now let's talk a little bit about your books because i'm kind of curious about okay um where where your writing goes because i like i write too uh i haven't published anything but I, I love to write a lot of stuff and i can tell when i'm not feeling there uh-huh because I'll go back and read it, and I'm like, "Dear Jesus, where's the, <laughs> where's the knife?" Just yeah, yeah. I, I feel that pain. I've uh, I look back. You know, my when I started writing, of course, I was writing short stories, like like most people do. And I look back on those stories that I wrote when I was a teenager, and I just I I want to just burn them. Uh, I want to burn them not only in, in paper form. I want to burn them from my memory. <laughs> That's how bad they were. Um, I started when I was about 18, I started writing what would become my first completed book, um, completed, but not published because there were some problems with it that I just was not capable of working out at that time. So that book is hidden away somewhere. And I, eventually I hope to return to it, but who knows? I I ain't getting any younger, so I don't know if I'll get around to that or not. But my first well, you know what? Let me talk about one of my biggest failings as a writer, okay. which was that just as I was foolish enough to think that I could tough out depression, I was also one of those idiots who thought that I would write when I felt inspired to. <laughs> and as time goes on, you just get less and less inspired, you know? <laughs> and And so it just doesn't happen. And it wasn't until I was that I sat down one day and I said, you know, here I am at an age I don't want to say, and I've got, (laughs) I have two books published, which is great, but, but man, you know, the first one was published in in 2001 and the next one was in 2004. And then at the time I'm thinking this, it was like, you know, 2010 or 11 or something. And I was like, well, what have I got? You know? So, um, it was at that point that I started taking it a lot more seriously. Let, let me let me clarify. I've always taken the writing itself seriously. What I didn't take seriously was sitting my ass in the chair and actually doing it. Got it. So once I started doing that, well, in, in the time since then, I've had two books come out and uh, a third one that's still being birthed. There's something I'm, I forgot to ask. 
because you said you went on this 20 year journey of being a tough guy and not. <laughs> Let's not say that. When I say tough, I, I don't, I don't at all mean to imply that I'm a tough guy. No, <laughs> well, no, no, for, no. for those of you who are listening to this, when you see the photo, you, you are very, you're impressive. In person, you're impressive. Oh yeah. I look like a bouncer, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I like, along at the bar the about, staring yeah. out at people with my arms crossed, but, but I'm, you know, let's put it this way. Toddlers love me because I'm a big teddy bear. Yeah, sure. So that kind of puts it more in perspective. So there you go. For anybody out there listening, he's still single. Um, <laughs> and so what convinced you or what pushed you to finally um, get on, on some sort of treatment or, or, or seek help? Um, well, after my second divorce, things were a little rocky for a little while, as they usually are in those kind of situations. And I thought, well, I should probably, I should probably go back to therapy. So I did. And I was in therapy for about six months when I realized, you know, this is just not cutting it. It's, it's not enough. So that was when I said, okay, let me, and of course, by, you know, by this point, I had a lot more knowledge about depression and about antidepressants and then all of that stuff. So I was less opposed to the idea. And once I started, Taking my first antidepressant after just a few weeks, I, I noticed a big change. I was like, well, crap. I could have been feeling like this for the past 20 years. So yeah, it was, uh, it was just a matter of, it, it just had to be time for me. Now, obviously we can't go back in time and, and change things. No, cause the one time I tried that, it really fucked things up. Yeah. <laughs> You can cut that from the show. <laughs> um, I'm curious now. Uh, oh, no, that's just my my absurd sense of humor. Oh, okay, cool. I was like, really? But I was, I was going to ask, is there anything, because I'm an AA also, I'm, I'm, I'm a recovery alcoholic and drug addict, and of course there's, you can't go back and change things. You can make amends to them and then move forward. Mm -hmm. Has there anything, is there anything in your life that, you are able or were able to go back and say, Hey, this is what was going on. And then just move forward. Well, yeah. Um, I have, you know, in this, in this wonderful age of the internet, it's, it's become not too difficult to track down old friends that you had no idea how to, how to get in touch with before. Right. And there were a couple of, a couple of instances where, um, a friendship that I had just kind of ended and I always blamed myself for it. One in particular, and I, and I've, I've tracked down this friend of mine and I said, Hey, I want to apologize about something. And he goes, what? So I explained to him, well, this happened. And I said, this, it was really inconsiderate. And, and then our friendship kind of just petered out. And he said, Vince, I, I have no recollection of that whatsoever. I'm like you're okay. kidding me. I've been feeling guilty about that for like 25 years and you don't even remember it, man, am I messed up? <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so there was nothing to really forgive in that case. And, and, you know, Hey, rekindle little friendship. So that was nice. I've, I've discovered too, and, I, and I'm glad that you mentioned it, uh, that in, in when I'm, in, when I am in those places, we talk about it like it's it's another universe. When I'm when I'm in those spaces, mm -hmm. uh, I can recall a lot of things that I, in my head, have messed up or were faulty of or said, mm -hmm. and like that. I've talked to people, and I, I'll talk to my sister. I'm like, "Do you remember this and that?" And she's like, "How do you remember that?" Like, "No, I have no clue." I'm like, "Well, that was one day when I was," and she's like, "I, whatever, okay, move on." Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, does that happen often or, or have you learned to process that? Um, well, that, that one instance I just mentioned was probably the biggest of them. Okay. I would, it would be nice if I could, you know, reach out to the, the first wife and explain some things. Um, but that's just not going to happen. So, um, so, you know, got to move on. So, if you could step outside the box for a second and analyze yourself, 
where are you now? I'm on vacation in Lake Tahoe. <laughs> Period. <laughs> there you go. Um, where am I now? Um, honestly, I, I feel I feel stuck a lot. I'm in a situation, uh, you know, that they call the the golden handcuffs. I have a day job that that pays pretty well, that has a good amount of job security. And because I've worked there so long, I have a a very nice chunk of vacation time that I get every year. And yet, I'd rather not be doing that job. I, I don't find it very rewarding anymore. So I want to move on, but I feel stuck there because of all these great aspects of the job. Right. And that's kind of where I feel with my life in general, too. Um, I'm, I'm very happy with, for example, the books that I've produced, but I want to produce more. And I just, I can't seem to, to get past the stage where I am. Um, making money from it would be nice, too, you know, just to, so if, if people want to buy the books, that would be awesome. <laughs> Well, tell us about. I, I was oh, you want me to you want me to self promote? Yeah, uh, I was hoping you'd see, go more into the books earlier. See, this is the thing. I um I love to write. I hate to market. I'm I'm not a good marketer. I I don't like marketing, and I'm not sure if I'm not good at it because I don't like it, or if I don't like it because I'm not good at it. The end result is the same. I don't uh, I don't really promote enough, okay. so nobody knows about my books except for the people who see well, me. Well, here we are, and here we are. Um, well, you know, my books are uh, can all be seen at my website, VincentMWales.com. You can download free chapters. My first novel, called "Wish You Were Here," uh, was a fantasy novel that came out in uh, two thousand one. Great timing. It came out one month before 9-11, so nobody was buying anything anyway at that point, so that was just, that was bad timing. Um, second book came out in 2004, and it's a dystopian future kind of thing called One Nation Under God, and that one's probably my best known book so far because it reads like nonfiction, <laughs> and some of the things that, um, I don't want to say that I predicted them, But things that I wrote about in 2004, some of them have come true. Some of them have happened. I I did not, for the life of me, um, ever foresee someone like Trump getting elected. But, but yeah. But a lot of the stuff in there was what many people have said was that it was kind of prescient. And I said, no, no, it wasn't. Because um, all you had to do back then was really pay close attention to what the writing on the wall was saying and, what I wrote about was just a possible future that we could have gone through. And in some ways, I think at the time, of course, most of my friends were saying, well, this is kind of far-fetched, don't you think? We'd never do that. And I'm like, dude, Trump is president now, so no, I wasn't being far-fetched at all. So <laughs> there's that. Well, now I'm curious. I want to get it so I can read it and have you back on and talk about your book. Okay. Yeah, I'm all for that. And- and then the uh, the other books, uh, I'm doing a trilogy, so two of them are out. One of them is, you know, I'm just kind of constipated with it. So uh, they are collectively, they are called, they're called the Many Deaths of Dynamistress, and they are basically superhero memoirs. Oh, I, I have some. Things. So what are the names of these books? You've only said what they're about, but you didn't say the name. No, I did. Wish You Were Here was the first one. Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry. So the second one? One Nation Under God was the second one. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I kind of missed that. And then the third one? The third one's called Reckoning. Okay. And that's and the one the you're fourth, working on right now? Nope. Nope. That one's out. That one came out a few years back. Oh. And, uh, and then the fourth one, uh, Redemption, was the sequel to Reckoning. And that one came out as well. And the one I'm working on now is the conclusion to that trilogy. And it's called Renaissance. So I'm I'm interested in reading One Nation Under God and then okay. having you on and talking about it. So I have to get that book. And well, then I'll have to read it again so I know what to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we're at the point of the show where we give some words of wisdom to the folks listening out there. So uh, Vince and Wells, what words of wisdom, and this could be on anything in your life or any issues or reading or writing or uh, health-related 
Vincent M. Wells, what are your words of wisdom? My words of wisdom. Golly. Um, you know, we talked earlier about suicidality and stuff. And I, I mentioned that, you know, I worked as a counselor and, and I have lost some loved ones to, to suicide. And I think the one thing that I want to say to people is that life sucks, but it's the only thing we've got. You know, I'm not a believer in an afterlife, so this is it. I've got to make this life the best it can be. And for me, that means being the best person I can be, being as good to others as I can be, helping others as much as I can in any way that I can. Um, and I think that, that action is probably the source of, of the most, the most joy in my life is knowing that I've made a difference for other people. That's awesome. That's awesome. So we're almost at the end and I just have a couple of sure. some, some of my intriguing questions. So through the different chapters of your life, if there would be a couple of words that could describe you, what would that be? A couple of words to describe me? <laughs> wow, how do you do that, Daniel? I mean, how, how do you how do you pick out a couple of words to describe you? Because there's so much to any individual person. Well, you, you can add more than a couple. You can make a sentence if you want. You're a writer. <laughs> Write something. I'm a writer. I'm not a speaker. You give me an hour to sit down and work on this, and I, you know that's one thing. But damn it, Kirk, um, I'm a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a doctor, not a banana tree. <laughs> I have no idea where that came from. Uh, <laughs> I, I like to think of myself as being witty. I keep telling Gabe that I'm the funny one on our show. He thinks he's the funny one, but no, it's, no. it's just no, not, no. it's just not true. Um, intelligent, creative, kind, I think is probably a big one. I think kindness is the most undervalued quality in people. We just don't appreciate it for how much it, it how much value it really has. Um, let's stop there because that's a good one. Okay. And for somebody out there who, as they were listening to the show, go, Oh my God, like I can relate to all that. What would you tell them? Wow. Um, I would say then help others understand, you know, I mean, that's, that's the goal of, of the show that Gabe and I do is to educate more than anything else. Um, and education is a way of helping people. So um, if you can relate to anything that I've talked about, see what you can do with it. See if you can use that to turn it into something positive for either you or for people around you or for total strangers. And, and the last question before we say goodbye, uh, there's somebody out there, they agreed with everything we talked about, they know they're there. They're about to go into the door and they're like, nope, I'm going to tough it out. <laughs> Toughing it out doesn't work. You know, it just doesn't. I mean, toughing it out works when you've got a splinter and you have to pull it out. But, you know, it's, depression is, is bigger than you. It's bigger than me. It's, it's bigger than any one person. I don't care how tough you are. It will pound you down without you even realizing it. So don't be that person. Awesome. Well, everybody, uh, I've been talking to Vincent M. Wells, uh, author and mental health advocate. Uh, if you have not had a chance to listen to this show, now that you've seen it on my Facebook page, because I'm going to post it there, I'll start off by posting the show where that we did at Healthy Voices, and then you guys can follow them from there and find all their other shows. Uh, follow him and Gabe Howard. Uh, and I've been calling him Rojo, and I have to tell the story. <laughs> Go for it. Because it's really embarrassing for him, and it's funny for us. Um, <laughs> for those of you, once you see the pictures, uh, 
Gabe Howard is a redhead. He's a, he's a big, tall guy, redhead. Uh, can't miss him. And on Even one, if you want to. If you want to, yes. And he's, he's the most lovable person in the world. And on one email thread, I said, whatever Rojo, R-O-J-O in Spanish, Rojo, which is red, uh, wants to do, I will do. Well, him not knowing Spanish thought I said Rojo. And he didn't quite understand what that meant. So I think he asked his daughter, and I'll let him tell a story at that time. But uh, He doesn't have a daughter. Is it, <laughs> was it a son? He doesn't have any kids. Oh, well, some kids. He well, has, was, like, younger sister, maybe. I don't know that, who he asked. Who, well, the story was that some some kid told him, um, that's not Rojo, that's in Spanish. Right. And then he asked, well, how do you say it? And they didn't want to tell him, and they just walked off. <laughs> so he didn't. St- he standard corrected, but not un- not learned anything. So I call him Rojo, and then I said that at the conference, and then people caught on, and several people were calling him Rojo. So <laughs> that's, that's his nickname. Hello, Rojos. So a big hug to Rojo, who I'm sure will listen to this podcast. Uh, we love you. Uh, any last words, any last comments you want to share with us? No, just uh, thanks for having me on the show. It was it was great getting to know you at uh, Healthy Voices. I hope to see you there again next year because it was a lot of fun. Yeah. And, you know, let's stay in touch and do this again. For everybody listening, um, if you are an advocate in your area in whatever uh, illness, uh, health issues, whatever it is, and you want to join a group of advocates, uh, next year, get in touch with me, send me a private message and I will send you the link so you can sign up, uh, when it comes up next year and I will walk you through the process. It's really easy and it's a conference unlike any other one I've ever been. Uh, you definitely enjoy it. Uh, and again, it's uh, put on by Jensen Pharmaceuticals, a sub of Johnson and Johnson. Um, for now, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank, uh, Vince for being on the show, my producer, Kevin Moyers for all his help and support. Thank you, sir. Uh, inviting everybody to join us at abnormalentertainment.com where you can find all the shows on the network. Follow me on Facebook at uh, Put It Together Podcast where you can catch uh, videos, pictures, and all my other shows. Or go directly to abnormalentertainment.com and follow the link to put it together. If you'd like to be on the show, please get in touch. Send me a private message on whatever social media you're finding my show on. Let me know you want to be on the show and... Uh, just like Vincent, just come on and, and, and share your story and tell us how you put it together. For now, uh, I want to thank Vince for being on. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. And this is Daniel Garza saying, hey, put it together. This is how I put it together. This is how I put it together. This is how I put it together. Subscribe to Put It Together on iTunes, Stitcher, and at abnormalentertainment.com slash put it together. Find Put It Together on Facebook and tweet Daniel at Lil Mesican, L-I-L-M-E-S-I-C-A-N. And for more podcasts, comics, books, movies, and more, head to abnormalentertainment.com. You've been listening to the Abnormal Entertainment Network.